All right. Nothing, nothing, nothing has contributed more to the mass incarceration of people of color than the war on drugs. Now, is this ranting and raving? Absolutely not. A police supervisor once stated, there's as much cocaine in the Sears Tower and in the stock exchange as there is in the black community, but those guys are just harder to catch. Those deals are done in the office buildings, in somebody's homes, but the guy standing on the corner, he's almost got a sign on his back. Those guys are just arrestable. So what happens? Instead of deploying officers and long-term arrests of suppliers that over uh, uh, three months may only result in two arrests, the decision is made to deploy those same officers to the black community, to Tyrone standing on the corner, and make 200 arrests. Despite the fact that arresting those two guys in the suburbs may have shut down five or six crack houses, what do the police and politicians say? They say that they are responding to the elderly neighbor, Miss Pearl, who lived on the corner where I used to live. They say that they came to the community and militarized full force because she would call them and expected that. They say that she wanted them to immediately make those 200 arrests in her community, that she didn't want to hear about any two-month investigation. So I pondered. Why did Miss Pearl not want to hear about that? Is it because the correct message had not reached her? Is it because she had been inundated and captivated by erroneous media depictions? You see, Miss Pearl and many of us did not understand just what a mandatory minimum sentence was, that it didn't matter if college student Kimba Smith got caught up with the wrong guy and that he beat her and threatened her and her family so bad that she was scared to come forward about his drug dealing. It didn't matter that she's pregnant when thrown in prison. Doesn't matter that she never used or handled any drugs. The mandatory minimum drug law said that she had to serve time, 24 and a half years of it. There are no mitigating or extenuating circumstances when it comes to mandatory minimum sentences. Ms. Pearl didn't understand what the infamous 101 ratio meant, that the boys in the hood who were convicted of selling five grams of crack cocaine the weight of a couple of packs of sugar received a mandatory prison term of five years, whereas it took five 500 grams of powder cocaine to receive the same five-year sentence. She didn't know that one-third of all federal cocaine cases involved an average weight of just 52 grams the weight of an ordinary candy bar. She didn't understand that Tyrone was not a major drug kingpin and that the federal government had no business in his prosecution. And she didn't know that the building of prison beds were predicated upon the test scores of black boys in the third grade. Now, Ms. Pearl did know about the 13th Amendment to the Constitution abolishing slavery, but she was unaware of the prison slavery exception clause. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist except as punishment for a crime. So during the height of the war on drugs with mandatory minimums firmly in vogue, shocking punishments of 10, 20, 30 years on life imprisonment for drug offenses were normalized and hardly raised an eyebrow. They surely didn't raise Miss Pearl's eyebrows. But these commonplace sentences snatched mothers from children, men from loved ones, and furthered the destabilization of families and communities. But there was one thing that Miss Pearl was clear on. For impoverished communities disproportionately impacted by policing, incarceration, and violent crime, the pu that public safety requires meaningful employment, fair and affordable housing and adequate public educational opportunities. Now, during the early 1990s, I walked the halls of Congress lobbying against what became known as the Crime Bill of 1994. And this bill featured the largest expansion of the death penalty in modern times, the trying of 13-year-olds as adults, the gutting of Pell educational grants for prisoners, the implementation of the federal three strikes law, the refusal to address the crack powder disparity, and slews of new mandatory minimum sentences, and incentives for states to lock up more and more people for longer periods of time in exchange for loads of money to build more prisons. And when this bill passed, a news item happened to catch my eye. It stated that there was this prominent securities analyst in Virginia who spent a weekend combing through every single detail of that federal crime bill and watching the debate on C-SPAN. And he came up with a list of what he called 
theme stocks for the 1990s, and what you think his highest recommendation went to? It was none other than the Corrections Corporation of America, which at that time was the nation's most successful operator of private prisons, whose stock had recently hit an all-time high. And in fact, CCA's chief financial officer was quoted as saying that, quote, the crime bill was very favorable to us. I was shocked. Why? Because it smacked me in the face that we have a situation where the deprivation of liberty is powered in large part by the profit motive. We have a situation where there, there are economic interests in keeping sentences harsh and long so that the prison populations continue to soar. You see, from a management point of view, a prison can be, can be characterized like a hotel or a motel. You want to fill every bed every night. And if you don't have enough guests, you do whatever you can to get them, including supporting campaigns for mandatory longer sentences. It is past time that we confront the disastrous policies of the past half century. This country's mammoth experiment in mass incarceration has been an abysmal failure. Kudos to Michelle Alexander for popularizing the analogy of today's system of mass incarceration with earlier systems of social control such as Jim Crow. Yes, we are talking about the institutionalization of second-class citizenship once one is released from prison. Yes, we are talking about disparate treatment and profiling, arrest, and sentences. But we may also be talking about the possible extermination of generations as well. Unfortunately, my elderly neighbor, Ms. Pearl, passed before the 2008 passage of the Second Chance Reentry Legislation. She passed before the Fair Sentencing Act of 2010 became law, which reduced the 101 um, disparity between crack and powder cocaine. She didn't get a whiff of the winds of change on the horizon. She didn't know that the narrative on crime was shifting and that criminal justice reform was not the lightning rod that it once uh, was. She didn't get to hear uh, uh, that former Attorney General Eric Holder, smart on crime policies, focus federal prosecutions on large-scale traffickers rather than big players. She didn't know that President Obama was the first sitting uh, 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 president to visit a, a, a federal prison. She didn't know about his executive clemency initiative to provide relief for those serving inordinately lengthy mandatory minimum sentences. She wasn't around for the bipartisan uh, Senate introduction a couple of weeks ago of perhaps the most comprehensive federal criminal justice legislation in a generation. And she will be shocked to hear working alliances between the Koch brothers and the ACLU and Van Jones and Newt Gingrich. It is a new day and a new narrative being formed. So in conclusion, although Ms. Pearl did not witness this dawning of a new day, and it's unable to help shape this exciting new narrative, you and I can, we can now at a point where we can openly discuss the data that we have known for years that sending people to prison and keeping them there for an unconscionable lengthy time doesn't make us any safer, doesn't deter future crimes, and does not promote successful reintegration back into our communities. We need to find better, more cost-effective ways to push the envelope to achieve change. We need to raise the ante and have the audacity to advance creative, solutions. The Miss Pearls of our communities are crying out for us. Let us not fail them. Thank you.